Well, good evening. Hey, listen, it is good to see you tonight. I am thankful that you are here as we continue this journey through the book of the Revelation. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 20. I hate to break up good fellowship time, uh, but <laughs> y'all know how a bunch of Baptists are. Which, hey, can, hey, I'll just tell you this, though. Listen, there are a lot of churches where, the, and you may not believe this, but there are churches where folks go there and they really don't like each other a whole, a whole lot. They come in, they don't talk a lot, they, they sit for a little bit, and then they head out. So we ought to be thankful that we like each other. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> so I'm not fussing at you, but I also know that we, we got a long way to go. And as that old song says, a short time to get there. So we're going to go ahead and dive on in if it's all right with y'all. Revelation chapter 20. Now, when we come into Revelation chapter 20, I'm just telling you, man, there, there is some really, really good news. I have, I have longed for Revelation chapter 20. Well, about since we started looking at the seals, the, the bowls, and the trumpets, because when you see the destruction and death and carnage, you see the adversary and his minions from outside perspective ruling the day, I've looked forward to the day in the, in the future when he's going to be handled once and for all. And so that's what we're going to see in Revelation chapter 20, although... When you look at Revelation chapter 20, there's a long, a, a large period of time that transpires in the first several verses. And so we'll talk more about that as we go. But before we dive in, can we pray together? And then we'll just dive right on in. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for time together. Thank you for my brothers and my sisters who are here tonight. I thank you for the kids and Pastor Justin, those working with them, getting ready for their Easter musical. Thank you for Pastor Brandon, who's over teaching our teenagers tonight on the Bible, is it your word or is it man's word? And God, I'm thankful that we have a copy of your word in our hand, that holy men of God were born along by the Spirit, and we have in our hand your word to us. And God, what a treasure it is. Uh, God, it's complete and it's inspired and inerrant. And God, we thank you that we have something that we can trust that reveals you to us in all of your fullness. We know creation reveals you, but God, because we have your word, we know who you are and what you are like. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. God, tonight I pray as we dive into this great text, oh Lord, that we would um, see what's going to transpire. But God, we'd be filled with hope, uh, knowing that although the adversary... Uh, may have his day now. He may be, uh, from outside perspectives, ruling and reigning the day now. There's coming a day when he will be bound, and we praise you for it. Go with us now. Help us to honor you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Revelation chapter 20. And we're just going to read the first six verses. I do want to go ahead and warn you. We're not getting through the first six verses, but we are going to read the first six verses. All right? Stand with me, please, to honor the reading of God's word. Revelation chapter 20, we're going to begin there at verse 1, all right? Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, and a great chain was in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it. And sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the image or his beast. And he and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's important. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him. For a thousand years, you can be seated. Now, when we think about that phrase that you heard a couple times, it's the thousand years. It is what is known as the millennial kingdom of Christ. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the millennial kingdom? 
Not the millennium falcon, the millennial kingdom of Christ. You say, Ron, why is it the word millennium? That's the word that's for a thousand. Now, when you think about the millennial, the millennial kingdom, there are really three main views about that. Now, I want to make sure that we're clear. When you think about a millennial view, there is a view regarding the millennial kingdom, and there is a view regarding the tribulation. All right, there are some who are pre trib folks. That would mean that Jesus would return before the tribulation period. I am one of them. I believe that Jesus is going to return before the tribulation period begins. There are some who are mid-trib, who would say after the three and a half years or so, Jesus would come in the middle of the tribulation to take his church with him. And then there are post-trib, or at the end of the tribulation, that is that Jesus would return in glory. Basically, it would kind of be like this. He, he returns, he calls his people up, and then they come back down, just like up and down immediately. All right, um, That's kind of the views on the tribulation. Well, then you think about the millennial kingdom. There are some who hold to a pre-millennial view. That is that Jesus is going to come before he establishes, before he establishes the kingdom. He's going to come visibly, in person, and that's at the end of God's wrath. And we've been walking through the wrath of God, haven't we? The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. That view says that Jesus is going to come at the end of that and establish a kingdom on earth. And when you think about these views, you've got the pre mill view, which I would argue is a more literal reading of the text. When you begin to read the text and you begin to think about the Old Testament promises of a kingdom... It seems to fit most logically that this is the view. And when you read it literally, I don't see how you can get anywhere else. Now, some would argue, well, you're just speaking about, um, you know, allegory or a, a mystical type view. I think when you look at the literal reading of the text, premillennial is the way that you would come out. Now, you think about it, in the Old Testament, we see promise after promise after promise that God is going to establish an earthly kingdom that there is going to be a king who will rule and reign on the throne of David. And so we, we see this, all of this happening, that there's going to be a Messiah that would come and rule on the throne of David. And so I would argue that that supports a pre-millennial view. Now, some would say there's a, a post-millennial view. Now, when you think about post-millennialism, it was pretty big in America for a while, and then you had the world wars, and it's pretty well gone out of out of. I don't want to say out of style, um, kind of faded off the map. I, did, I, do, I do remember in seminary we had one guy that came in and was a passionate post-millennialist. I mean, he really believed that we were going to preach and usher in the kingdom of God and that we were going to advance with the gospel to the ends of the nations and that the world was going to, there was going to be a great revival and that we were going to usher in the return of Christ. Um, premillennialism says it's going to get worse and worse before Jesus returns. So just thinking about that, what, in your perspective, how many of you would say, Ron, it seems like the world is getting better and better. It's getting more and more mindful of Jesus, welcoming of Jesus. The world is getting better and better. Okay. Um, I've done the straw poll. It seems like there's nobody here. All right. Well, what about, how many of you would say, Ron, it seems like the world every day is getting darker and darker and worse and worse? Again, that would, that would argue, now that's not the only reason we believe it, but that would, that would lean towards a pre-millennial view. Uh, Post-millennial says it's going to get better and better. Pre-millennial says it's going to get worse and worse. Then you come to amillennial, and that basically, that there's not going to be a literal kingdom, that the kingdom of God is actually now. When you think about, has anybody heard of the term the great parenthesis? Have you heard of that, that idea? Um, that's that's the, the church age. Kind of the time that we live in, the age of the church. From the time that Jesus went back to heaven, the Spirit came at Pentecost until the kingdom. They would argue that there is no literal kingdom on earth. It is just the church age. It's, it's now. Jesus is ruling now. He's here with us. Uh, not necessarily even a thousand years, um, but that the, there is no literal kingdom. 
Now, I guess the problem with that, for me at least, is what do you do with all of the promises to Old Testament Israel? Um, how do you deal with that? And then what do you, why do you kind of ignore this phrasing that we read over and over, that he will be bound for a thousand years. They will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now, when you think about the book of the Revelation, how many of you recognize that we have seen a lot of numbers in the book of the Revelation? There were seven literal churches, right? All the way back in chapters 2 and 3. Seven churches. There were 12 tribes. There were 12 apostles. There were 10 lamps. There were 10 kings that would rule. So over and over again, we see literal numbers referring to literal people and events. And so I would argue... If you look at literally speaking, you've got to have a thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, you ask yourself the question, what's going to be happening during the millennial kingdom? Well, I'm glad you asked. Notice with me, please, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, and a great chain was in his hand. I want you to see what he does. Look at verse 2. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Now, did you see four titles for the same person? Did you see it? The dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan. Now, that's not four different people. That's one singular individual. And bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and shut it up and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. Now, are you looking forward to that day? Now, let, 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 me, let me explain it a little better, and I think, I think you might look forward to it. Do you see where Satan is described at that point? He's described as bound... And cast into the abyss. Now how many of you would agree now it seems as though Satan is running amok among us? It's not exactly what Peter said, excuse me, Paul said in Ephesians 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Listen, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He says, listen, there is an adversary who is operating among us. He is operating in this world. He is influencing and has infiltrated this world. Now, when you think about what's already happened in chapter 19, the, the rebels who fought against Christ have been slaughtered. The, the false prophet and the antichrist have been cast into the lake of fire. So he's already taken care of a lot of people who were fighting against him. He's already taken care of this, this, as Adrian Rogers described him, Satan's Superman, the Antichrist. He's already taken care of the false prophet. So who now is he going to deal with? Now he's going to deal with Satan. Now, I've read this multiple times. I don't want you to turn back there. But aren't you thankful that what we see happening in Revelation chapter 20 goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. When the adversary led Adam and Eve astray, he said, listen, there's coming a, a, from the seed of a woman somebody who's going to crush your head. And we're seeing it here. Now, notice the beginning of the verse. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. Now, when we see this, then I saw, it's interesting, this is almost like a, a chronological marker. John is going to give us, hey, this is what I saw happening. This is how this thing begins to unfold. This is how it transpires. We see that back in chapter 19. We see it here. And as you walk through this chapter, these scenes are playing. I, I saw this happening, and I saw this happening, and I saw this happening. Kind of a sequence of events. And that's what he's describing now notice he sees an angel coming down from heaven. Now you ask yourself, who is the angel? Um, can I tell you the answer and then tell you my opinion as to who it is? The answer is we don't know. You want to know why? Because it doesn't say, then came so and so from heaven. It says, then, then there appeared an angel or the, an angel coming down from heaven. So we don't know for sure who it is. But can I tell you who I think it is? Turn from Revelation back over to Jude. 
Jude, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, John, Jude, and Revelation. <laughs> Whenever I say that, I can, I can hear uh, Eben Sorrow singing that song. Uh, I, I got to work with him in Awana, and he goes, Jude and Revelation. <laughs> That's how we did it, just to try to do something to kind of encourage him to remember it. Jude, verse 9. Go back to verse 8. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. I, I think most likely... It is Michael. Now, can we say for sure? Yeah. I don't know. Well, we can't say for sure because it says an angel. We can't say for sure that it's Michael. But I think it is. Yeah. Sir? Yeah. I mean, and so I think, I think we can say, seeing some of Michael's activity, I think we have kind of an educated guess. But, the, again, the, the Scripture doesn't say for sure. Now, now notice, um, when you think about Michael coming, would you agree with me that Michael is an enemy of Satan's? Would you agree with that? He confronts him here. Um, uh, can you imagine being Michael? Of all the angelic kind of um, responsibilities, wouldn't this be a good one? I mean, if you've got to have a job as an angel, wouldn't it be great to be the one tasked by God? Because you don't forget. Who was Satan? Now, go step all the way back into the book of Isaiah. Who is Satan? He's, he's Lucifer. What was Lucifer? He's an angel, all right? And so imagine back however long ago that was. You say, Ron, how long ago was it? I don't know. The Bible doesn't really tell us. We have kind of a chronology of the earth, but we don't know how long it was back in the past when Satan rebelled. Lucifer, son of the morning, rebelled against God and was cast out. So you see this angel, Lucifer, rising up against God. And God cast him down. And he led other angels with him. Now that's going to be important because in just a little bit we're going to talk about some of these other angels. So you see Lucifer, this exalted angel, this anointed chair of the Bible describes him as... He is cast out of heaven and others follow with him. And those fallen angels, what do they become? Demons. That's right. So you have, when you think about angels, you really have, now you have holy angels. You have the leader of the fallen angels, Satan. And you have demons. All right. Now when you think about demons, we're going to see in a moment, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but you've got Loose demons that are loose, and you have demons that are in bondage. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna see that more in just a little bit. Uh, but notice Michael comes. Can, I mean, can you imagine Michael was there when when Lucifer rebelled, when Lucifer was cast down? He's fought against him, and now, if it is Michael, for God to say, "All right, here's the key to the abyss. I want you to go down there and take care of him." That's that, that's something that if I was Michael, I'd volunteer for. Are y'all, are y'all with me? Like, I got it. I, I'll go, Father. I, I got you. All right. Um, so we see this key of the abyss. Now, this word abyss, you said, now, where does that come from? I mean, have, have we heard anything about the abyss before? Hold your place in Revelation 20. Turn back to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Now remember a moment ago I told you that there are there are demons there, there's the the head of the of the the demons Satan then you have fallen angels that become demons you have ones that are loose and operating among men and some that are bound 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 when you get there say amen For if God did not spare angels when they sinned Notice, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. This is the same idea of the abyss. 
this place of intermediate punishment, this place reserved for judgment. You say, does Jesus ever talk about this? He does in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed one, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Now notice Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Go back to Revelation 20. We're going to see where Satan is headed, but he's not headed there right at this moment. Notice this place where he's going to be sent. And the devil... Who, was decei- who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So you see the lake of fire, this place of eternal torment, differentiated from the abyss. The abyss is a temporary, it's kind of like, um, how many know when folks get arrested here in Alma, if they're going to end up at the federal prison, they don't, they don't stay at Alma all the time, but they're here for a time and then they're transferred to their Final, well, I don't want to say final destination. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? But, but that's what's going to happen with Satan. We see him going. He's about to be put into the abyss. Now, go over to Luke chapter 8. I do want you to, to see this abyss one more time. Luke chapter 8. I'm not going to tell the terrible preacher joke. If my kids were in here, they'd be like, Oh, Dad, don't say that one again. Um, how many of you remember the, the story of the demons being cast into the pigs. Y'all remember that? What Remember Jesus comes, Luke chapter 8. The guy confronts Jesus, this Gadarene demoniac, and he's, he, he comes to him. And hey, remember, his name is Legion, for we are many. And Jesus casts the demons into the swine. And what do they do? What do the swine do? They commit suicide. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. I just, I, I'm sorry. I just couldn't resist. I mean, it's just, it's just so good. I mean, <laughs> I've been saving it, Miss Andy. I, I had it right there, and I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then y'all are looking at it. Uh, anyway, all right. But, but notice before, before that happens, notice their request. Did you see it? Go back. Look at verse 31. No, back to verse 30. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. Verse 31. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. So you see, these demons were operating at the time. They had... They had indwelt this man. They said, don't send us into the abyss. Don't send us into that place of torment. Don't send us into that prison. Let us keep working. Now, this abyss is not the final lake of fire. It is a place of punishment and torment, but it is not their eternal destination. That's going to come later in the text. So you see angels. You've got the, uh, these fallen angels, demons, Some are bound in the abyss, and some are operating. You say, now, Ron, um, where do those demons come from? Where does this where did this happen? I I think you can make an argument for Genesis six. I'm just you can't say for sure. Now, remember back in chapter nine that there were two hundred million of them bound at the river Euphrates, and then they were loosed. I think that's what we see with this abyss. Now, notice, Michael has the key. Now, you ask yourself the question, how many of you have a key to your house? You got a key, right? You have authority to enter your house, right? You can take your key. Now, some, how many of y'all have a, 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 a number punch pad where you just kind of punch a number in and you go in? Anybody? A few. Um, But most of us have a key. You take the key, and because you have authority to go into the house, you take the key, and you can enter, and you can exit. You go in, you go out. You've got the key. You have the ability to go in. Now, um, it's interesting. Go back to Revelation chapter 1. Verse 
Revelation chapter 1. And when you get to verse 17, say amen. You remember this is where John sees Jesus, right? And when he sees him, verse 17, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and am the living one and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And notice, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. So Jesus has all authority. He has the key to death and to Hades and apparently the abyss. Because go over to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 verse 1. When you get there, say amen. amen. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. So we see an angel who had been given a key and had authority over the bottomless pit. Now again, who, what, which angel was that? I don't know. Could it have been Michael? It could have. Could it have been another strong angel? Of course, we don't know. But we do see Jesus has the key of death and have Hades. Now this angel has the key of the abyss. And I go back over to chapter 20. He has the key of the abyss and he gives it to him. And notice, and a great chain was in his hand. Now, you say, Ron, what is he going to do with the chain? Um, how many of y'all have ever uh, been out walking and you saw somebody that was walking a dog that was too big for them to be walking? I mean, you're walking, and uh, this happened to Tammy and I the other day. We were, uh, we were over on Jekyll on Tammy Friday, and we're over there, and uh, this lady is walking this dog. And I don't know whether it was a pit bull or whether it looked like... It looked like a horror movie waiting to happen. I mean, it had this big old mouth and these big old shoulders. Have you ever looked at a dog and thought, that thing could eat me up? Well, I was praying for three things, okay? Number one, please, Lord, give that woman strength. So if that dog decides he wants to hurt me or Tammy, she can hold him back. Well, number two, and then I look at his harness. And it's looked like he's got a harness made out of paper mache. <laughs> I'm like, Lord... <laughs> Do not let that harness slip off that thing. Because, I mean, it was one of those things. I mean, you could see as, as he's doing this number right here. I mean, the muscles just rippling in his shoulders. And those claws. and those. Yeah. So, Lord, let her have strength. Lord, let that harness hang on. And then I looked at the little, <laughs> this little thing. That, I mean, <laughs> Those of you who had little girls, you know, sometimes you have these little dresses that have these little kind of ties that you tie the dress on. It's like a, tell me, what is it called? It's, 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 it's like a, um, y'all know, I mean, they just kind of tie, it's not a lace, but kind of a silky ribbon. The, the, the rope holding that monster. Look like the, the ribbon that a little girl's dress would be tied with. I said, oh, Lord, let her have strength. Let that harness hold. And do not let that ribbon give way. And thankfully, I'm here and I wasn't harmed, nor was Tammy. That's a blessing, right? You see a, a harness and a ribbon and a little weak lady trying to hold back a, a dog that can be a little scary but can I tell you something a serpent a dragon the adversary the accuser of the brethren we need somebody who has the strength to bind him up and can I tell you the good news I don't have to pray oh God I hope you have enough strength you want to know why <laughs> he does and I don't have to pray Lord let that harness hold <laughs> because he's not doing a ribbon harness did you see what he's going to use and a great chain was in his hand 
Now, if you go back to that same Gadarene demoniac, this one who would, they would try to chain him up and he would break the chains off. Demonic activity in a human could break human chains. But notice, the angel who has the key to the abyss comes with a great chain and he is about to bind up the adversary. And so you ask yourself the question, is it successful? Does the angel have the strength to do it? Look at verse 2. And he, the angel, laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. And it's interesting to me that John uses all of these descriptors. You say, Ron, why would he call him the dragon? Go back to Revelation chapter 12. Look at verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. Verse 4. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth he might devour her child. Now we've already talked about all that, about how we see the devil here. In this text. But notice he's described as a serpent of old. The, 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 the dragon. Now the serpent of old. Now what is that a reference to? Go back to Genesis chapter 3. How the serpent was more cunning than any other. And he comes. And he deceives, the, he, de, he deceives Adam and Eve. And then we see who is the devil. It's diabolos. It means a slanderer. I'm going to tell you something, that the, the devil is a liar and the father of all lies. He accuses the brethren. He is a liar. And he's a, he's a devil. And notice, he's Satan. It literally means an adversary, an enemy. He has opposed God from the start. He's going to make himself like the Most High. He, I will be like God. And God says, oh no, you will not. Hmm. I'm telling you, this is a, I'm, verse 2 is a tremendous moment in history. This serpent, this dragon, this devil, Satan, who has deceived and lied and murdered the thief, John 10.10, 10, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm telling you something, in Revelation 20, verse 2, he's about to be bound so he can steal no more kill no more, and destroy no more. Now, he's going to be released for a short time at the end of that, but for a thousand years, he is cast and bound in the abyss. Now, can I be honest with you? I I look forward to that, don't you? I look forward to the one who has been described as a roaring lion seeking somebody to devour, where he is a tied-up kitty cat cast into the abyss. Roaring lion, nope. Right? Hey, can I tell you the good news? You're going to get to see it. The Bible says to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. We are going to be with Jesus. When Jesus is there, we are going to see all of this unfold. (laughs) Can y'all imagine the shouts of praise when he's cast into the abyss? I don't know exactly. This is, this is Ron 316, all right? But if it's Michael, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say, get him, Mike. Go on and get him. And I don't know, I don't know how it will transpire. I, I, I don't know. It doesn't tell us. I don't know whether he'll kind of wrestle him down like a UFC match or whether he'll be like just a piece of paper crumbled up and tied up. But I'm telling you, when he's cast into that abyss for a thousand years, I believe the joy of the, of the redeemed and of the saints will be like, <laughs> that's good, isn't it? He throws him into this abyss. And by the way, that, that abyss, it, it, it literally means a, it's a bottomless place. It's a bottomless pit. You ever felt like your teenager was a bottomless pit? You feed him and feed him and you get through feeding him and they say, Immediately, oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> Mikey's little. <laughs> I'm hungry. So they throw him in to the bottomless pit. Now, some would argue that Isaiah 24 refers to this. I think it's possible. 
And notice it's not just throwing it in him, throwing him in it. Notice what else happens. And shut it and sealed it over him. That's pretty good, isn't it? So it's not just that he's chained and cast into a bottomless pit. That The pit is, is shut and sealed. You know, just reading that, you know, what it, you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me, have you ever heard the phrase, an exercise in futility? Does anybody know what that is? It's kind of like you're doing something, but there's just no way it's going to work. It's an exercise in futility. Reading that, shutting it and sealing it over him, you know what it reminded me of? When Jesus died, and Pilate says, go make it as secure as you can. Yeah, good luck with that. Remember, they rolled the stone, they sealed it. We're going to keep it secure. Three days later, the king came out. And, and, and why did he come out three days later? As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so the son of man. You, you want to know why it was three days? It's because Jesus said it was going to be three days. He could have said four days. He could have said two days. He could have said six days. He could have said as many days as he wanted to, but he just said, hey, listen, I'm telling y'all so y'all know when to come look for me. Three days later, I'm coming out. But Satan, chained, cast in, shut up over him. You want to know how long he's in there? A thousand years. Why? Because God said so. You see, now it seems like Satan's in charge. But can I tell you something? He can only do what God allows. Go back to Jekyll Island with me. You ready? That scary dog. Imagine that as the adversary. But he's not held by a little woman with a flimsy Harness and, and ribbon. The God of heaven has him on a leash and only allows him to go as far as he desires. God is sovereign over him. Notice, as he's shut in and sealed over him, notice there's a purpose clause. Did you see it? So that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Notice, when you think back to all the deceptions that the adversary has wrought. Let me go all the way back to Genesis 3. You remember? You won't die. You'll be like God. All the way back, he was deceiving. Has anybody here ever been deceived by the adversary or his minions? You ever thought that something was going to be good and you bought into the lie and gave in to the temptation? Yeah, this is good. And you look back and say, man, I, I fell for it. He is going to be bound. He is going to be cast into the abyss. He is going to be sealed so that he can deceive no more. And you think about it. What's going to happen? Now, think about what's about to transpire. Okay? We've seen this multiple times. Until a thousand years is over. Now, think about what's going on on the earth right now at this point. Jesus has come. The, the, the sword that proceeds out of his mouth has slayed his enemies. There are redeemed, saved folks on the earth that are going into the millennial kingdom as just like we would be if we were alive. Okay. Now listen, we're, you're going to be with Jesus. I believe you'll be raptured out. You'll be coming back with him in the clouds. But if you were alive and you'd accepted Christ and you, he comes, you would not be annihilated with his enemies. You would be welcomed into the kingdom. Does that make sense? Is everybody, is everybody following me? Well, now, after that, then you're going to have people who are living in the millennial kingdom. And we're going to talk about that next week, about how... It's going to be different. I mean, the lion's going to lay down with the lamb. The, the world is going to be different. All right, so you have people, redeemed people, who are reproducing for a thousand years. You say, Ron, how many people are going to be birthed in a thousand years? How many do y'all think if babies could be had in a thousand years? A bunch. 
Can, can we just agree that it could, it could be a bunch? Those people will have the choice. Am I going to bow the knee to King Jesus in salvation? Or am I going to reject? Right? Is that, are are y'all following with me? They're like us. They will, they will be born and then they'll have to make a choice. Now, I would argue that it would probably be easier to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord when you see him ruling and reigning on the throne. Literally ruling on earth. But do you know that at the end of the thousand years, Satan is going to be released and they will mount a one last time rebellion against the king? But how many of you have ever heard somebody say this? The devil made me do it. Okay. If you've heard somebody say that, kind of wave at me or nod you. If you ever heard somebody say, well, I just couldn't help it. The devil made me do it. Can I just say two things, and I'm not trying to be unkind. Number one, you're probably not that important because of the billions of people on the earth. You're probably not important enough for him personally to influence. Now, we do see, can I tell you one time we know for sure that the devil entered somebody? Judas. When Judas betrayed Christ, the Bible says the devil entered him. The devil made me do it. Can I tell you something? In the millennial kingdom, nobody can say, the devil made me do it. Why? Where's the devil at during the millennial kingdom? He's bound. He's bound in the abyss. So no longer can anybody say, well, the devil made me do it. But what's it going to be like in the millennial kingdom? Can I just give you a glimpse for a second and then we're done? That, that there will be peace. There will be righteousness. The world will be different. And there will be a king ruling and reigning on the throne. And you and I will be ruling and reigning with him. What does that mean, Ron? I don't really know. I don't. But we'll look at it more next week. All right, pray with me, please. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for this time together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are sovereignly in control of the universe, that you rule and reign on the throne now, and there will come a day where you will visibly, bodily rule and reign on this earth, and we will rule and reign with you. And so, Lord, until then, as, as we were taught to pray in your Lord's Prayer, in the model prayer, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, may that, be, may that be true of us. God, may your will be done in our lives perfectly and completely as you'd have it. God, help us. God, help us to do what you want us to do. And Lord, understanding that there's coming a day when the serpent, the devil, the dragon, he's going to be cast into the abyss. God, I pray that we will tell those around us of our King, of the good news of the gospel. Lord, go with us now. Help us to honor you. Thank you that in a world where there's all kind of bad news, tonight we've had the privilege to see there is a brighter day coming. I love you, Jesus, and I praise you in your name. Amen and amen. Well, hey, listen, God bless you. You're dismissed. Don't forget, next Sunday morning after the service, if you're interested in going on the mission trip, be sure and see me. We're going to hang out for just a few minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes, just to kind of talk about some details, okay? Uh, but if you're not going, I encourage you to pray and ask how you could support as we go, okay? God bless you. Have a great evening. We'll see you soon. Hey, let's do this. Hey, don't forget, Miss Sherry and Randy and Trudy, they're heading to Israel next week, right? Sunday. So why don't we do this? Can, can we just pray for them as they travel? Lord, would you keep this group safe as they travel to Israel where the Lord Jesus walked and fed 5,000 and calmed the storm? God, I pray it would be a life-changing experience for them where they'd never be the same. God, you'd protect them and bring them back safely to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, you're dismissed. God bless you. Have a great night.